with Anthropology 1.0. And as we've been learning, the most important lesson from Anthropology 1.0 is what? I'm just gonna keep saying it until, until it sticks. <laughs> that culture is more important than race. Now what I should say by culture, because it's hard to define culture as we've learned, is that learned behavior, what we learn, our ideas about, you know, how we, how we, is more important than our biological destiny, you might say. This is what Abu Lugod calls the anti-essentialist intent of culture on page 134, which she says is the good part of culture. The most important of culture's advantages is that it removes difference from the realm of the natural and the innate. Whether conceived of as a set of behaviors, customs, traditions, rules, plans, recipes, instructions, or programs, culture is learned and can change. So this is the anti-essentialist intent. And what Abel Lugot is saying there is it doesn't really much matter we don't have to worry too much about the idea of culture as long as we know that it is learned and can change, that that's the, that's the big issue here. And what I would, I, I guess I should also add to this is that the first intent of anthropology and people like Boaz and Benedict and Mead was to be against the hierarchy of the time, which sorted people out into sort of the better and worse, the, what we call ethnocentrism, thinking your own people and your own customs were superior to those of others. And this is something that anthropology fought against. And it brings us to an idea, well, this was rather extremely expressed in the article by Renato Rizaldo, where he's studying headhunting. Tori, this is pretty intense when somebody's slicing off somebody else's head. Yet, you did not necessarily condemn this. Why not? Why didn't you just say headhunting is wrong against their culture? Yeah. What do we call this when we say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to be in a position to say that it's wrong? What's another word for that? What do we call it when we look out at another society and we say, I want to at least understand what they're doing in their own context before I say something about it. The idea of cultural relativism. So Tori is not going to condemn the headhunters until she understands what they're doing. Now, I want to be careful about this because actually, I there are times that we can say that certain practices, even if they may be rooted in a cultural tradition, we're not saying that you can never say anything is right or wrong. So we don't want to confuse cultural relativism with what we might call philosophical relativism or moral relativism, because cultural relativism is actually meant to be a way of understanding what other people are doing from inside their own point of view. However, sometimes we might wish to understand that in order to change or adjust that. So it is not, as it's sometimes been depicted, just an idea of anything goes. But you do at least have to try to understand what people are saying and doing from within their own society before you make a larger judgment. Now, in Anthropology 1.0, or we might call Introduction to Anthropology, what is the most popular reading of all time? If somebody were taking an anthropology class and you meet them 20 years later, when your parents or your sister are taking an anthropology class and the one thing that you have probably all read, Horace Miner's Body Ritual Among the Naki Rain. Yeah. Your parents probably have read that one. It's almost always assigned an intro to anthropology. I'm trying to think of anything that will be more famous than that. It's the most. For the people who, they're like, yeah, I read that article. 
people read it outside of anthropology as well, just, just for fun. The second most popular article, although this is not as universally assigned, but and not as universally used, but it is Laura Bohannon's Shakespeare in the Bush. I think it used to be more popular because it was also assigned in English classes. And it's basically about Hamlet gets interpreted differently among the Tiv in Nigeria. That's a that's a fun article to read, but like I said, it, it, you're you're much more likely to have read the body ritual among the rainbow. Now, why do I say that? Because what is the popular take on if you took Anthropology 101 and you read the Naki Rama, what is your what is your take on that? What do you get out of it? What is your what is your, what's the lesson? Like, they're so, you're saying, oh, all these people are so weird. They're so, they're so weird. But then it turns out to be us, right? So it's like, you're like, mind blown. We're weird to them. They're weird to us. We're just all just weird and different. So if somebody else is doing head hunting, that's fine. That's their thing. I'm exaggerating. The popular take on this, though, is that basically it's not that necessary that culture is like more important than race, but it's not like people just start using the word culture to describe what they usually thought about or they might have thought about as races. And so culture becomes like race. She says it's fine when it's anti-essentialist, but what the problem is, as we have talked about, is that it still makes puts people over there in the others. Now, it may be, as Pluto was describing among the Naki Rama, we become the others then. And then it's like, okay. But what she says is, Abelou Goad says, is there's a tendency to freeze difference or to make it like race. So she says, despite its anti-essentialist intent, however, the culture concept retains some of the tendencies to freeze difference possessed by concepts like race. So basically that although we learn that people have different cultures and that it is learned behavior, it nevertheless tends to, tends to put people into these boxes and then freeze them there. And whenever I hear somebody say, well, that's just their culture as an explanation for things, I know that probably what I then we say goodbye to is the idea that there's any connection between, say, the Naki Rama and the indigenous peoples, which is the tropes of indigenous peoples are what Miner is drawing upon for that article, or that there's a power differential or the historical stuff. So culture becomes a way of waving that those explanations away and just saying that ah, people are different, we're all weirdly different, who knows why? So we talked about how a number of anthropologists believe that we needed to bring back history, interconnection, inequality, and power. And these anthropologists tended to adopt a Marxian framework and use what is called political economy as an explanation. So we talked about the work of Eric Wolf in Europe and the People Without History and Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, which I would say I'm going to call them Anthropology 2A for today, which again, as we talked about, they were frustrated with this cultural whole idea that the way in which people had been frozen in place and disconnected from each other. This was a response to that. Now, there was also something that I'm going to call Anthropology 2B. There was a different trajectory in anthropology, which we see in this section, which is called On Writing Cultures. And in Anthropology 2B, there was this huge focus on writing and interpretation. And it is perhaps most associated with the work of Clifford, I would have always said Clifford Geertz, because look at those two E's in there, Clifford Geertz. But one time, actually back when I was 
an undergraduate, I was able to hear him talk, and he seems to he seems to call himself Gertz, but he kind of mumbles a lot through his beard, or he did back then. So I'm not sure what he was saying. He was a better writer than he was a speaker. Gertz's interpretation of cultures would become extremely famous. And for people who were in the social sciences or in history, or even maybe in college in general, Clifford Gertz became kind of the most famous anthropologist. He was seen as sort of a literary type who could also write and write well to the extent that some of us would get frustrated, say, in graduate school, if we talked to our historian friends and we would say, hey, have you, have you looked at the anthropological literature on this? And they say, would say, well, I read some Clifford Gertz, as if that was the be-all and end-all. And I would say the most famous article or reading within anthropology in the college-educated literary set is an article that they give an excerpt here for called the Balinese cockfight. I thought it was interesting that like, we have five articles to choose from and you all chose everything except the Balinese cockfight, which is, like I said, interesting to me because this is, again, the most famous article in anthropology. So first of all, let's deal with Bali. When I say Bali, what do you think of? Yes, Indonesia, good, yay. There it is, a little tiny part, a tiny island within the many islands of Indonesia. Why do you think that? Do you think anything else? It's a famous place, yes. It's one of the most Instagrammable islands in the world. With stunning beaches, emerald jungles, and luxury villas. And the people are also known for being all mystical. So as Gertz described it, they walk around and they're just doing their rituals and and they they wouldn't even pay attention to him it was like you were the wind or a cloud just to look through you at least at the time so there's Gertz in Bali working on his Instagram feed what was he doing there he's doing his field work they would have cockfights so those those were technically illegal and so they went to the cockfight and then when the police came the Gertzes they were married then doing field and they started running from the police and they ducked into this place and they pretended to be having tea and talking about culture and after that that was like their entree it was like now they were accepted as as and they could do their field work now and gertz's interpretation of the balinese cockfight what he says is that cockfighting becomes symbolic or it's made to represent both masculinity but also the status hierarchy of Balinese society. He says that although people have these cockfights, it doesn't really change in anyone's status. No one's status really changes, he says on page 125, but it's like a it's like a metaphor, a text that you can read about Balinese society. So what Gertz claims is that the cockfight is a text. It's like something that you can read in order to understand Balinese society. And he makes a larger claim about basically his way of understanding anthropology, the interpretation of cultures. He says the culture of a people is an ensemble of texts, themselves ensembles. So it's like bringing all these texts together, which the anthropologist strains to read over the shoulders of those to whom they properly belong. So it's like there are people are writing or reading these texts, texts, texts. All right, texts have a different meaning today. I forgot about that. In the old days, this meant paper book or something, a text, some metaphor. But it still works today. The culture of a people is like all their texts together, all their text messages together, with anthropologists straining to read over their shoulders and see what they're texting each other. That's basically what anthropology is all about. And here we are trying to look over it.
Societies like lives contain their own inter interpretations. One has only to learn how to gain access to them. So if you can just figure out how to get inside this society, if you can just figure it out how to read over their shoulders, you will find that they interpret themselves as a close reading. Now, this came to its fulfillment in a very famous book, which lends its title to this section, Writing Culture, the Poetics and Politics of Ethnography, which was a collected volume from 1986, which, as you can see, has a lot to do with the practice of anthropological writing and poetics. This book, like Clifford Gertz, became very popular with the literary types, the academics, people who like to do what Gertz calls close reading of things. As some people have pointed out, most of the authors in this volume were old white guys who then were rereading or going over the texts of dead white guys. I'm not the only. Abu Lugod points, points this out. She says that, that Clifford himself in the introduction apologizes for the feminist absence. There were maybe one of the 12 or 13 chapters was even written by a woman. So there is an apology for that, but there's also in general, as she notes, an absence of indigenous or native anthropologies or even anyone from that set. And so in some ways, what this did was to re instantiate or re-inscribe some of the vantage points of anthropology. So on the one hand, it was trying to, to take us away from that objective perspective and call our attention to the idea of writing. But on the other hand, it seemed to simply, in some ways, circle around the guys. Now, I just want to say here that Gertz's interpretation of the cockbite led to other people looking over. Going to a cockfight became almost like an anthropological rite of passage. You had to go see if they were doing cockfights in your field site and go see if you could see one and, and figure out what was going on there. So a lot of people did this. And then Alan Dundies eventually wrote a book that I once assigned in classes, in a, in a J-term class, and just took all these together and then came up with his own interpretation of what was going on in the cockfight, which was a little bit different than Gertz. And in terms of what Dundies believed about what the cockfight was. So for, yeah, for Gertz, of course, the cockfight is a text which you read. But for Dundies, the cockfight is a thinly disguised symbolic homoerotic masturbatory phallic duel. Wow. There's some... It is one of the best sentences. Dendys is not is an anthropologist. He's more associated with folklore. In fact, he, he chided Gertz for not telling us enough about of all these metaphors and things. So he was going to say that it's a thinly disguised symbolic homoerotic masturbatory phallic duel with the winner emasculating the loser through castration or feminization. It's pretty intense. So yeah, he had a different take on this, although it's not unrelated to what Gertz was saying. Now, in some ways, the way that anthropological theory was going at the time, the writing culture set, I'm probably going to say some things in this class, which I'll get in trouble with. So I'll just start with this one, that anthropological theory of this tradition was itself becoming a thinly disguised symbolic homoerotic masturbatory phallic duel between guys who were putting their interpretations out there and trying to win the argument. Now, that said, I will also say that the alternative, those the Eric Wolf people and the Sydney Mintz people, like we talked about, some of them were 
maybe more open to gender than others, but it's not like they were very into feminism or positionality or being reflexive. They weren't really into dancing, at least as far as I know. And so when I think about my the the sort of Eric Wolf Mintz and Cindy Mintz kinds of accounts, like if they talked about religion, well, for those of you, what did, what did Marx think about religion, for example? What's the Marxian approach to religion? Y'all remember the opiate of the people type. So if they even looked at religion, it would be like, you know, this, this silly thing. We talked about the Haitian Revolution. In some ways, you cannot understand the Haitian Revolution without understanding drums, dance, and spirit possession. I'm not saying that that was the basis for it, but it was extremely important. Even these people who draw our attention to these things, maybe they should understand more about dance. There's an anthropologist for you. Boom. Yeah, pretty cool. Catherine Dunham uh, is perhaps known more as outside of anthropology, pioneer of African-American dance, you know, took these Caribbean rhythms. She was studying in Jamaica, but was interested in the African diaspora and, and this idea of uh, embodied knowledge, how our, our interpretations become embodied and how somebody like a grandmother can still do this dancing stuff, which has, is full of meaning. Interestingly, she was a student of a couple people we've read, Sapir, or studied with Sapir and even Malinowski in the University of Chicago. And so she was actually well within the anthropological tradition, but you're, there's, there's a number of videos that we could look at, one of which is still called the Dunham Lab Dance Technique. So I was, I was going to show you this, and that's good, but I kind of like the video that you found better. So I thought maybe we'd watch this. This idea of it, it matters, positionality matters. This is a great quote. It matters whether one is a Black woman anthropologist. And one of the things that you might then realize that other people don't, I think you mentioned, was, you know, that there might be things that white guys experience in the field, which are not the same as get this, getting that different perspective. Boswell is very interested in the sensory interpretation of things and the, the feeling of things. What does it feel like? And so it's a very good, our, our editors have meant these uh, first and last articles of the parody. We all, you also found something by Boswell herself, which I thought was what she's doing these days. That was worth thinking about. Rewinding a little bit, I should have asked. If you were, if you were studying headhunting in, in any society, what would you want to know about headhunting? Be the biggest question in your mind about why? <laughs> probably. <laughs> you probably the question of why. What would they be like? Why did you do that? What was their answer? Rage caused by grief, and so they would just say, "Yeah, rage born of grief." This is the way. That is almost like saying this is the way. By rage born of grief. And if he asked them to follow up, they would. They wouldn't. That would be it. They just be like, no, that's it. There's no follow up. That's the thing. And Rosaldo was like, nah, that can't be right. He kept looking for like a bigger interpretation, some bigger why than that. He's like, he didn't, he could not accept that. He could not understand what they were saying. He didn't really, it didn't make sense to him. Until, yeah, until his wife, who was working as a field worker, Shell or Shelley, Zimbalist Rizaldo, he is still read in feminist anthropology, super smart and good field worker, but falls to her death along a mountain trail while doing field work. And you know, he wasn't Rizaldo. Renato Rosaldo wasn't there, but comes up later and uh, has 
obviously has grief, but starts to feel that the rage. Now, he doesn't go off and do headhunting, but he says that basically, now I get it. Now I understand this, this thing that they were feeling. I finally get it. And so in this article, which is a pretty famous article in anthropology, he's basically saying that this idea that what you were supposed to do in anthropology was to achieve what is called thick description, multivocality, polysemy, richness, and texture doesn't really do it. And that the idea that we could just read culture as a text is in some ways a false comfort because it makes you think that all you need to do is, is go there and, and talk to people and that you'll then figure it all out. It's probably a little bit exaggerated to say that this is like, Gertz, you, that doesn't make any sense. But it was against this idea that you can simply figure things out from reading things like a text and that the personal experience was very important. And so it was at a time that that result was challenging the notion of this idea that the anthropologist was supposed to be neutral and impartial and objective. And he wasn't necessarily saying that there was no such thing as objectivity. And he wasn't necessarily saying that there was, that this other idea was better, but he wanted to basically appreciate that we were moving toward this idea that there were knowledgeable social actors who had a position. And so that when you did anthropology, when you were actually doing this ethnography, what you were was not trying to be objective or above or outside, but to recognize that you yourself had a subject position and that you were also talking to and working with people who were themselves had a subject position. And so from pretty early on in anthropology, this is, was written in 1989, but it's not the important part isn't to be this idea of objectivity or neutrality. It's to be able to, uh, to have this positioned experience. And that is important, both for the anthropologists and the people that you're talking to. I thought it was kind of ironic that when I looked up, Rosaldo is, is still around. He's still, he's mostly writing poetry these days. But I thought it was funny that when I went to his Wikipedia page, it said that somebody was too closely connected to the subject and that they needed to have a more neutral point of view when they were authoring this. And I was like, that was Rosaldo's whole point, that there wasn't a neutral point of view, but we still like the neutral point of view. We still believe in it, right? So to this day, people come in and say, the anthropologist needs to be totally neutral, totally objective and neutral. And I agree that an anthropologist shouldn't be biased, right? But it's not, you're never going to achieve that neutral point of view, not a thing. Now, I want to yeah. take us back, back to Abu Lugon, who gave us a lot in this article. And this article, she talked about the absence of feminism in the writing culture set, but she also talks about how it was still the case that people who were indigenous anthropologists, who were called native anthropologists, or what she calls halfies, people who had a root in that culture, were accused of not being objective. They couldn't get that objective perspective. And what she says is that given the ideas of culture as this whole wholeness and bounded thing, the that it was looking a lot like race, that we needed to adopt a strategy of writing against culture. And so she talks about three ways in which you could do writing against culture. One was a turn to some things we'll be looking at, to practices and discourses. So trying to get away from this idea that a culture is just this bounded whole thing. And so you know, just talking about the concreteness of what people were doing. She also talks about needing to emphasize connections, and she cites some pretty approvingly the work of Eric Wolf here and talking about power dimensions in history and in the present. She could have also cited her mother, Janet Abu Lugod, who is a 
was a pretty famous historian and sociologist who wrote a book called, her most famous book was called Before European Hegemony, The World System 1250 to 1350, which talks about, again, these interconnections that existed outside and before the colonial encounter. She also wanted us to do ethnographies of the particular. And so what she was trying to get away from is this idea that Gertz and others had that you could describe the Balinese or even the Naki or the Americans or the so-and-so as if you were capturing the totality of their, of their culture. And she did this herself, I think quite well in a book called Writing Women's Worlds, Bedouin Stories. And these she have collected stories that weren't all tidy and wrapped up and interpretable. Some of them were, and she has some of these at the end of, end of her article here. And so showing us kind of the multiple dimensions of culture. Abel Goad also wrote an article that I, I have often used to assign, it was written in 2002, called Do Muslim Women Really Need Saving? And that became one of her most well-known and popular article. And at the time, this was right after 2000, and the events of September 11th. And, and at the time, people were justifying the invasion and intervention in Afghanistan by the idea that we needed to save these Muslim women. And Abu Ghod was doing an interesting take here, which was to say that on the one hand, it was not true that people needed saving, but she was also trying to question this idea that you could simply step back from everything and just say, anything goes, that's the way they are, we'll never be able to do anything about it. She wanted to really impress upon people that we were historically interconnected and that actually there was a reason to participate in that world, but for the cause of the right of living without, without war. She then followed up with a 2013 book about that had a similar title that have expanded on this argument and has in some ways come back into the mainstream, not the mainstream, but obviously today these issues are, are with us. And I found this article that she wrote in uh, December of 2023 on a feminism that embraces humanity. Abu Lugoda herself, her father as it was a prominent Palestinian and then Palestinian American scholar. Her mother, as I mentioned, Janet Abu Lugod, was also a prominent scholar, Jewish heritage. So interesting, interesting connections there. I thought that it, I thought that this quote from Abu Lugod was uh, from December of 2023 was fairly important to put out there. Abu Lugod writes that I have been truly moved over these last two months by the visible leadership of feminists, women, and the LGBTQ plus community in their calls for ceasefire and their charges of genocidal violence. At marches and rallies and actions around the country, I see how they have learned to shout through bullhorns, determined to keep attention focused on what we are all seeing with our own eyes. They're naming the existential conditions under which Palestinians have been forced to live and die, whether under bombardment or scattered, expelled, and dispossessed. They insist that history did not begin on 7th October, 2023. My grandmother, my father, my uncles and aunts, and some of my oldest cousins were forced into exile. My friends and colleagues who stayed, whether in 1948 Palestine or internally displaced in the West Bank or Gaza, have been subjected to the harsh rule of the Zionist project of the Israeli security state. The students and activists have refused to be silenced, and I consider this the kind of feminism I want to stand with and the kind of feminism that Nadera Kevorkian, written about earlier, models for us, a feminism that embraces humanity. So as we've talked about, you know, what what does what can anthropological theory do for the 21st century? We've seen a few examples in this, and Abu Lugod is still is still out there and trying. 
So this leads us to what I am going to call Anthropology 3.0. I think that Abelou Goad, the reason I began with Abelou Goad and end with Abelou Goad is I, in some ways, I see her as a way in which we transition into a number of authors who I have combined different, these two different approaches, what we might call anthropology 2A and 2B, or I call it anthropology 2A and 2B. And in this anthropology 3.0, I, or I hope that we recognize that in, or not, that describing people as others in a, in a frozen difference as a cultural whole, that everybody is, is, is simply frozen in cultural place is not, is not necessarily helpful. So if culture means is Cultural relativism is definitely better than straight up racism, but it can be problematic to portray people as a cultural whole. So that in this idea, we would be able to talk about people's interconnections with each other, the inequalities between and within societies, the historical circumstances, and power. But we wouldn't necessarily or we would understand how people are positioned and why that is important and why it is important to understand how people dance and might get something out of the idea of spirit possession or other issues, how uh, the overlapping and intersecting identities of gender, race, sexuality, social class are all important. As we continue to read that many of these authors combine these things in ways that are, are important for today's world. An ongoing question for me is whether it will be, whether it can be what the 21st century needs, anthropological theory for the 21st century. Because although I would like to believe that anthropologists are now more attuned to these issues, there is nevertheless a tendency in anthropology to still be too white, too much within academic spaces, perhaps too fragmented into various pieces. And it's also very difficult to draw the attention of the public out there. As we think back to what things were like 100 years ago when anthropology emerged with Franz Boas and Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict, the I don't know. Sometimes I feel like the public is perhaps even more resistant to those ideas than they were 100 years ago. So whether this will work will be our ongoing question.